so we're underway with another video which is part three of our long educational series and in this particular segment we're going to deal with the four major language families and the four major patrilineal haplogroups of Afrika, Africa, whom of course all originated on the African continent. So what we have on our left is the four major language families and on our right is the four major patrilineal haplogroups, aka genetic markers, which is passed down from father to son father to son, father to son, all the way back in time to a common ancestor, a common male ancestor. So, first we have the Niger-Congo language family, which is predominantly comprised of haplogroup E1B1A, which is the haplogroup the majority of our people in so-called Sub-Sahara Afrika Africa belong to, as well as those of us males in the Western Hemisphere, descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. In number two, we have the so-called Afro-Asiatic language family, which is predominantly comprised of haplogroup E1B1B. And third, we have the Nalo-Saharan language family, who belong predominantly to haplogroup A, N, or B. And lastly, we have the Khoisan language family, whom also belong to haplogroup A, N, or B. So again, these are the four major language families of the Afra Khan African continent. And suffice it to say, before we move forward, it's important to note that all of these language families combined is sometimes called by scholars the Congo-Saharan language family, which is a macro language family that unites the continent which is said to have existed during the actual Green Sahara, AKA the Holocene period. So when combined all together, scholars call it the Congo Saharan language family. So of course, this reality of the four major African patrilineal genetic markers and the four major African language families is actually tied to our ancient Nile Valley cosmology predicated on the four sons of Heru, which was corrupted in the Bible as the four sons of Ham, Ham, which we're going to be deconstructing later on in our series as well. Continue. So, according to academic linguistic consensus, all modern Afra Khan language families have their ancient origin in the approximate Na Valley regions of East Afra Ka in the Sudan, Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, Egypt, etc. So we're going to introduce Dr. Theofalo Benga to segue us into the following information of our segment. Dr. Theofalo Benga is a scholar of Bantu descent. He worked closely alongside the Senegalese Wolof scholar Dr. Chek Unta Jop. Dr. Obenga produced many scholarly works, including non-Egyptian related Afra Khan truestory using linguistics. Obenga's great academic work was the use of the historical comparative linguistic method, the true historical comparative linguistic method. Through his expertise, he proved the linguistic correspondences, lexical, phonological, grammatical, etc., between various language families spoken in Afra Ka, Africa today. Continue. Obenga demonstrated that all modern Afra Khan languages descend from a source parent Negro Egyptian language family spoken some time before 10,000 BCE, which is over 10,000 years ago, during the time of the beginning of the Holocene, aka the Green 
Sahara. So let's read that again. Obenga demonstrated that all modern Afrikaan languages descend from a source parent Negro Egyptian language family spoken some time before 10,000 BCE. According to Obenga and Jop, the Negro Egyptian language family excludes all Semitic languages as well as Ethio Semitic languages and includes only Cushitic, Chadic, so called Afro Asiatic, Niger Congo, and Nilo Saharan language families today, all of whom are daughter languages of their parent Negro Egyptian language family spoken before 10,000 BCE. So, just to be clear, according to Dr. Theofalo Benga, all the different language families that you see are people speaking on the African continent, all derived from a source parent Negro Egyptian language family in the past. So all the various ethnic groups in modern Africa speaking these different languages all spoke a proto-Negro Egyptian language family in the past that was actually comprised of many dialects that throughout the course of time began to form many different independent languages of their own as our people interacted with each other as we migrated away from our Negro Egyptian homeland which was actually in East Africa, Africa which we're going to prove conclusively in this particular segment. Continue. Early human kinship from sex to social reproduction. So now we're going to show and prove. Strikingly, the most probable origin areas of each of the African families lay in the regions within or adjacent to the Horn of Africa. So the most probable origin areas of the Afrikaan language families is in the regions within or adjacent to the Horn of Africa, which is around the modern regions of Sudan and Ethiopia. According to the most recent findings, three of the four established families, one, nilo saharan two, Afro-Asiatic, three, Niger-Kordofanian, which is also called Niger-Congo, and four Khoisan divided the deepest level into two primary branches. In each family, one of the two primary branches is spoken across large areas of the continent, while the second primary branch occupies a restricted area in eastern or northeastern Africa. Continue. The first expansion of Niger-Congo peoples appears to have stretched from as far east of the Nuba Mountains of the Sudan, where proto cartophanian would have been spoken. And the proto cartophanian is the proto-form of the Niger-Congo language, 
Ubuntu is also a sub-branch of. So the first expansion of the Niger Congo peoples appears to have stretched from as far east of the Nuba Mountains of the Sudan, where proto cordophanian would have been spoken, to as far west as Mali, anciently the territory of the Mandi and Atlantic Congo branches. So as you can see, both of our sources so far further corroborates linguistically that the language family that our people who predominantly carry haplogroup E1B1A originated somewhere in the regions of modern day Sudan and Ethiopia. Just how long that time period of expansion took place remains unknown. So they're saying here that they're not certain of the time period of expansion. So what we're going to do now is conclusively determine an approximate time period by continuing to measure in our people's activities on the continent, archaeologically, linguistically, and genetically. So this is why we've been using a multidisciplinary approach in our methodology. Because where one field of discipline might be lacking support and corroboration, another field will definitely add and bridge the information together by exposing the full picture. The genetic structure of history of Africans and African Americans. So now we're going to read quickly through certain portions of this particular scientific article, which delineates for the most part the autosomal ancestry of black Africans in America, descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. So, Africa is the source of all modern humans, but characterization of genetic variation and relationships among populations across the continent has been enigmatic. We studied 121 African populations, four African American populations, and 60 non-African populations for patterns of variation at 1327 nuclear microsatellite and insertion slash deletion markers. We identified 14 ancestral population clusters in Africa that correlates with self-described ethnicity and shared cultural slash and or linguistic properties. So now here's the key. The ancestry of African Americans is predominantly from Niger Cordofanian, 71%, European, 13%, and other African, 8% populations although admixture levels varied considerably among individuals. So again, Niger Cordofanian, aka the Niger Congo, is predominantly the group of Africans that blacks in the Western Hemisphere primarily descend from, which as you can see approximates to 71%. However, other scientific sources, the 71% will vary, where it goes from about 70% to 75% upwards to 80%. So as you can see, our DNA is still predominantly African, which again derives primarily from the Niger Congo, Niger Cordofanian language family, who predominantly carry haplogroup E1B1A. So we're going to read from the same article, and it says, modern humans originated in Africa 200,000 years ago, and then spread across the rest of the globe within the past 100,000 years. Thus, modern humans have existed continuously in Africa longer than in any other geographic region and have maintained relatively large effective population sizes, resulting in high levels within population genetic diversity. Africa contains more than 2,000 distinct ethno-linguistic groups representing nearly one-third of the world's languages, of course, because the languages of the world all derive from the proto-language families of the African continent. Except for a few isolates that show no clear relationship with other language, these languages have been classified into four major macro families. Niger Cordofanian, spoken across a broad region of Africa, Afro-Asiatic, spoken predominantly in Saharan, Northeastern and East Africa, and Nilo-Saharan, spoken predominantly in Sudanic, Saharan, and Eastern Africa, and Khoisan, 
languages containing click consonants spoken by the San in Southern Africa and by Hadza and Sandawe in Eastern Africa. So once again, you're seeing the four major language families of the African continent. So what you're seeing also is where the four major language families are currently dispersed as our people migrated back and forth to different regions on a continent over time. Continue. Now, in hot pursuit of language in prehistory, essays in the four fields of anthropology. So now we're gonna read about the haplogroups E1B1A, which is also called M2, and haplogroup E1B1B, which is also called M35. So what's important to know here is that the majority of the male lineages on the African continent belongs to haplogroup E1B1A, AKA M2, and haplogroup E1B1B, AKA M35 who are both united by what they call the PN2, AKA E1B1 transition, who are the actual progenitor of haplogroups E1B1A and E1B1B. It is of interest that the M35 E1B1B and the M2 E1B1A lineages are united by a mutation, the PN2 E1B1 transition. This PN2 defined clade originated in East Africa. Again, this PN2 defined clade originated in East Africa, where various populations have a notable frequency of its underived state. So as you can see, the PN2, which is the progenitor of E1B1A, again, the haplogroup the majority of our people carry in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Western Hemisphere, and E1B1B, originated in East Afrika, Africa, just like we demonstrated in part one and two of our series. So this would suggest that an ancient population in East Africa, or more correctly, its males, formed the basis of the ancestors of all African upper Paleolithic populations and their subsequent descendants in the present day. So what this is saying here is that the PN2 E1B1 transition forms the basis of the ancestors in the Upper Paleolithic period to present day. And the Upper Paleolithic period is an anthropological term for the Stone Age that began approximately over 40 to 50,000 years ago. Now, so what we have here is Dr. Soikieta, who's the individual from part two that was speaking on ancient Africa and the ancient Sahara. So Dr. Soikieta, Senior Research Associate, National Human Genome Center, Howard University, Research Associate, Anthropology, Smithsonian Institute. Like its modern counterpart, Ancient Egypt was centered on the Nile Valley in the Eastern Sahara, Africa's largest desert. The climate history of this part of the continent, which has varied over time, has likely played a major role in how humans have moved and interacted through the millennia. This region was likely a major route for the exodus of modern humans from Africa. So here's the key. Between 50,000 and 15,000 years ago, the desert area west of the Nile was inhabited sparsely, if at all, due to the region's aridity. So as you can see, between 50,000 to 15,000 years ago, the desert area west of the Nile River was for the most part uninhabitable. Why? Because it was too dry, it was too arid. During this period, a succession of cultures flourished on the banks of the Nile. So again, between 50,000 to 15,000 years ago, a succession of cultures began to flourish on the banks of the Nile. So this is a long, long time period of our people developing and evolving along the Nile, which actually has to do with our ancient cosmology.
which is described in the Torah Papyrus when it speaks of the divine dynasty, the divine rulership of the goddesses and gods, the forces in nature who established civilization through us as their children, which we're going to expound on and elucidate in much more details later on in our series as well. As the rains came in from equatorial Africa in the early Holocene, the desert area became less arid and the people moved into the Sahara from all directions. Between 10,000 and 6,000 BCE, archaeological evidence has been interpreted to suggest that the number of people living along the Nile fell. At the same time, in the desert area west of the river, there was evidence of an increase in population and of pastoral societies that built large stone megaliths and sculptures, developed astronomical knowledge, made the earliest known pottery in Africa, and likely domesticated cattle. So now you're reading via the archaeological evidence that our people had astronomical knowledge, we built large stone megaliths, So as you can see, none of us is coming off of Noah's Ark in Mount Arawat as the fictional Bible will want you to believe. So that's his story. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is an elaborate myth used to map his story's origins and rise into prominence. When in reality, they're the ones with the primitive origins as a result of descending from the Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon after the last ice age. So meanwhile, our people were developing and flourishing on the banks of the Nile for tens of thousands of years. They were actually trapped in the last ice age, who later emerged from it with recessive features, as well as being backwards and savage. There are rock paintings of people and animals sometimes using themes that also appear later in Egypt, along with other aspects of the culture. So once again, just like we showed and highlighted in part two, you're also hearing via the archeological evidence that there were rock paintings and art in the ancient Green Sahara. After the climate again grew more arid after 6000 BCE, there is evidence for migration back into the Nile Valley. So again, our people were occupying the Nile for tens of thousands of years. Then when the Holocene began and the monsoon rains came from equatorial Afaraka, we migrated into the green Sahara that became lush and fertile. We occupied it for thousands of years. Then after the gradual desiccation, the gradual drying began to occur. The majority of us migrated back into the Sudanese and Egyptian Sahara and establish those colonies and states along the Nile.
archaeology, language, and the African past. So in this particular book, we're going to shift our focus briefly to what was going on in West Africa at this particular time period within the last 12,000 years. For whatever reason, West Africa was only populated extremely sparsely until the end of the Pleistocene, some 12,000 years ago. And the end of the Pleistocene is simply the period after the collapse of the last ice age. So what we're going to also learn here is that prior to 12,000 years ago, West Africa was virtually uninhabited, except by little small groups of hunter-gatherers, which were the actual groups that belonged predominantly to haplogroup A and B. So our people who carry the E1B1A genetic marker were not as of yet in the regions of West Africa, you see us today, until much, much later. Indeed, most researchers have claimed that the Sahara which stretched much further south than at present, was unoccupied. Continue. One feature of the Niger-Congo region is the virtual absence of residual languages. What languages the MSA hunter-gatherers spoke must remain unknown. And MSA means Middle Stone Age hunter-gatherers. So these are the hunter-gatherer types of peoples we just mentioned that was occupying West Africa, West Africa, before the Niger Kordofanian, Niger Congo branches expanded into that particular region. Only in South Africa, where the expanding Bantu speakers encountered the Khoisan, does a real mosaic of farmers and hunter gatherers still exist. But within much of the core Niger Congo area, only Jala in Nigeria and Lal in Chad seem to be true remnants of an earlier diversity that must have characterized the continent. These fragments point at a more ancient stratum of hunting gathering populations in West Africa, present at the time of the Niger-Congo expansion, but almost completely absorbed by them. So just like we said, the archaeological and linguistic record indicates that the Niger-Congo branches, who again belong predominantly to haplogroup E1B1A, encounter these hunting gathering groups who mainly consist of peoples like the Khoisan, Pygmies, and some Nalo-Saharan groups. So let's read that again. These fragments both hint at a more ancient stratum of hunting gathering populations in West Africa, present at the time of the Niger-Congo expansion but almost completely absorbed by them. Niger-Congo must have expanded and assimilated all the resident groups and must therefore had highly convincing technological or societal tools to bring this about. Again, Niger-Congo must have expanded and assimilated all the resident groups and must therefore had highly convincing technological or societal tools to bring this about. So in other words, he's posing the question, whether or not our Niger-Congo ancestors who expanded from their origins and encountered these hunter-gatherer groups had highly convincing technological tools. But not only did they have highly convincing technological tools, but what we're going to do now is prove archaeologically that they actually migrated from and brought those advanced tools with them from North Africa, North Africa, from the modern Sudan, Egyptian regions. the Oxford Handbook of African Archaeology. So here we're going to further prove and let the archaeological evidence be our witness that our people indeed migrated into North Africa within the last 50,000 years and partook in those technologically developed cultures that eventually gave birth to ancient Nubia and Egypt. In West Africa, there is very little evidence of people south of the Sahara prior to the mid-Holocene. So there is very little evidence of peoples south of the Sahara prior to the mid-Holocene. And such evidence as does exist is primarily of small scattered groups of mobile hunter-gatherers. 
of course, just like we showed in our other source, some of who return frequently, possibly even seasonally, to the same places. So again, you can see these hunter-gatherer groups were prone to moving around, and rightfully so, as they were still living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Davies and Shaw both argued that before the desiccation, again, the drying of the Sahara, before the drying of the Sahara, not only were Saharan inhabitants not compelled to move southward, but it was virtually impossible for them to do so. So our ancestors that was living and occupying the ancient Sahara during the Holocene period, it was virtually impossible for them to move southward. Postulated barriers to human occupation in southern West Africa include the difficulty of making a living in the dense rainforest prior to the advent of iron tools. So prior to the advent of iron tools, these technological tools, it was impossible to live in the dense forests. And potentially lethal diseases such as malaria, onchocerasiasis, and tryptanosomiasis, the latter an added problem to herders because it can be devastating to cattle. Only when climate zones contracted could people, and especially herders, move south. Continue. The artifacts found at many early sites support a northern origin for SMA people in southern West Africa. So let's read that again. The artifacts found at many early sites, the archaeological artifacts found at many early sites, support a northern origin for SMA people in southern West Africa, West Africa. And here, SMA actually stands for Stone Metal Age People. So these Stone Metal Age groups were the advanced agriculturist groups of Afrikaans that settled for a long period along the ancient Nile Valley, Sudan, and Egyptian regions, who continued to evolve while developing our culture and societies, thus becoming very advanced. Then later, some of us actually leaving the Nile Valley into the Green Sahara. Then from the Green Sahara period, some of us began to gradually migrate and penetrate the dense forests with our advanced stone metal tools, where we continue to encounter these small scattered hunter-gatherer groups, thereby absorbing and or displacing them. Projectile points are often in a Saharan style. Again, Projectile points are often in a Saharan style, with concave or convex bases, and pottery often bears comb and roulette impressions very similar to types known from the Sahara and the Nile Valley as early as the 10th millennium BP, which 10th millennium BP stands for the 10th millennium before present, so that's 10,000 years before present. So again, you can see that everything is unfolding nicely regarding the linguistic evidence, archaeological evidence, and genetic evidence, all helping us paint the full picture in order to trace our people's origins, activities, evolutionary development, and migration patterns. Now, so here we're going to read from one of the oral traditions of the Congo Bantu people who states that they actually migrated from North Africa because of the desiccation of the Green Sahara. After the drying of the Sahara, which was a gradual migration. So we also have oral tradition of the Congo Bantu people referring to this particular region and event on the continent, which coincides with the archaeological, linguistic, and genetic evidence. So, we're going to read Babutidi in Bantu Migration and Settlement in Le Mans Congo Cultural Collection, 1914. A long time ago in antiquity, people did not exist in this lower Congo. They came from north of the country. 
So a long time ago in antiquity, people did not exist in what is today called Congo. They came from north of the country. They're also in the north. People came from far off north. Again, they're also in the north. People came from far off north. The very north of Kainga. So they even have a name for this region and place that they're speaking of called Kainga, which we're going to actually be demonstrating and proving is actually derived from the ancient Khan, Kani, Kanat land of ancient Nubia and Egypt. So this particular name and region that the Congo Bantu people are speaking of, Kainga, is actually the Congo Bantu vocalization of an ancient name, title, and term used by our ancestors of ancient Kemet to refer to the land south of Egypt, the land south of Kemet, which we're going to be dealing with extensively because it plays a crucial role throughout our series. So this particular name plays a huge role throughout our series later on. So they're also in the north. People came from far off north, the very north of Kainga, Kainga is the name of the country, the region where lived our ancestors in antiquity. There they already knew how to weave the clothes they wore, forge holes, and knives that they used. So they're speaking of their technology that they developed and cultivated. So you're seeing knives which are iron tools. So these are the same type of tools they used to penetrate the dense forests because these were the agriculturalists that eventually migrated into the forest regions of Africa during the drying of the Green Sahara. So in Kainga, in ancient North Africa, they already knew how to weave the clothes they wore, forge holes and knives that they used. The main reason for their coming in this country, this area, was the famine that hit Kainga. So there was a famine, the very same thing that we were just talking about via the archaeological evidence and linguistic evidence of the drying of the ancient green Sahara. So this is exactly what they're speaking of in their oral tradition, that there was a famine that hit Kainga, which is north of the country, the northern part of Afraka, Africa. For many years, the drought reigned. Crops and fruit trees they planted dried up. So for many years, the drought reigned, the desiccation started to come and the, the Sahara, the green Sahara started to become dry and arid. They suffered a lot for this, unable to support the suffering they said to each other. Continue. So unable to support the suffering they said to each other. So they said to each other as a result of them suffering, let's go to Banda Mputu which means let's pass through the dense forest, the unbreakable wall, and organize chieftaincies because we have a lot of hunger up here. So they agreed, let's go. So now you can see that they began to penetrate the dense forest, which they were able to do due to the iron tools and technology they developed and brought with them from North Afaraka, Africa. So, of course, this particular migration also indicates what Eurasians call in academia the Bantu expansion, which, as you can see, didn't begin in West Africa, but actually started in North Afaraka during the drying of the Green Sahara. Indeed. So this is why scholars often say how the Bantu expansions, which, by the way, was a gradual expansion, gradual migrations, was able to absorb and or displace smaller hunter-gatherer groups they encountered due to their superior technology, their superior iron technology. So this is what certain Bantu groups brought from North Afaraka, from North Africa, when our people began to gradually migrate into the forest regions of so-called Sub-Sahara Africa. So in the past, in the past, Two chieftaincies ruled this part of the world region. When people escaped from the north of Kainga, they separated on their way. Some crossed the Nzadi Congo River. These are people who live in the Insundi area, the left shore of Nzadi, 
and others are those who live in the semi Congo, the right shore of Nzadi. So in the past, two chieftaincies ruled prior to colonization, prior to colonialism. Two chieftaincies ruled in the region of what they call today Congo. So these are the Congo Bantu oral tradition. And of course, this is where they currently reside and live in the west central part of Afaraka, Africa. Continue. So now we're going to delve even further into the archaeological evidence by letting it speak for itself that our people indeed originated and migrated from North Afaraka along the Nile in the modern day Sudan and Egyptian regions. So this source is called Bioarchaeology of the Transition to Agriculture. The population history of the Nile has been of considerable recent interest and focuses on two competing hypotheses. So now we're going to debunk one of the so-called competing hypotheses that's held by some of these Eurasians in academia, trying to say ancient Kemet was established by Eurasians from the Mediterranean and West Asia. We're going to debunk that now and show you that this is just total delusion on their part. The first suggests that the Egyptian dynasties developed in Sutu, which means internally from the earlier pre-dynastic and Neolithic populations represented at sites such as El Dabari. And El Dabari is an actual archaeological site in Upper Egypt, which is the southern part of ancient Kemet. So that's Upper Kemet, so-called Upper Egypt. The second scenario, which is the myth the second scenario suggests that migration of people from Western Asia led to the development of the Egyptian state. In general, so here's the key, in general, the archaeological evidence, so in general, the archaeological evidence suggests that the Egyptian state had an indigenous origin. So the archaeological evidence, which is the primary concrete evidence, suggests that the Egyptian state the nation state of Kemet had an indigenous origin, which means it developed internally within Afaraka itself. Continue. Two recent studies, so two recent studies, provide evidence for the population dynamics in the Nile Valley throughout the Holocene, so throughout the Green Sahara period, which is in the last 12,000 years. Zakrozwetsky demonstrates evidence for broad population continuity through time on the basis of craniometric variations on the basis of skull measurement with some level of population movement. Several recent analysis of dental variations, so now we're talking about orally within the mouth, come to essentially the same conclusion. Thus, in the most general terms, there is strong evidence for population continuity along the Nile from the late Paleolithic, which is over 40,000 years ago, through the Egyptian Empire, which is around 3,000 years ago. So we're talking about a population continuity of the same ancient Afarakan indigenous Nile Valley Africans from over 40,000 years ago up into the Egyptian Empire, which is the new so-called kingdom, the new kingdom which is circa 3,000 years ago. So this is what the archaeological evidence is actually saying, the most recent archaeological evidence. However, the diffusion of agricultural technologies into the Nile from other regions and subsequent trade networks of the Egyptian empire would have undoubtedly brought with it people and genes from other regions to varying extent through time and space. So it's talking about now, during the time of the Egyptian empire, circa 3,000 years ago, trading and commerce brought genes and peoples from other regions because of course our people expanded into West Asia and annexed Kanana, ancient Kanana, so-called Canaan, and made it a part of our state of ancient Kemet. So this is when the entire Nile Valley region was actually united 
and we were actually at odds and at war with our Eurasian enemies, which we have conquered. So essentially, all the foreign genes that they're speaking of that flowed into ancient Kemet and other parts of North Afaraka, North Africa, and the so-called Near East is actually stemming from the Eurasian invasions themselves, dealing with the neo-colonialism or the neo-colonization of the Assyrians, the neo-Persians, the Greeks, and Romans, and of course the Arab invasions that came afterwards. So you're talking about the neo-colonization of that particular region in West Asia that our people were actually ruling over and conquered. The entire Syria-Palestine region, which was called Kanana by our ancient ancestors, our people were ruling over those regions, and the Eurasians started to invade and started to Aryanize those regions, whitewashing those regions by polluting the blood of the indigenous inhabitants which was some of our ancestors from ancient Kemet and other parts of North Africa who were actually occupying and living in those areas at that particular time. So the reason why you see North Africa the way it is, is of course as a result of Eurasian, white Eurasian invasions, Indo-Aryan invasions, which of course came in the form of your Neo-Assyrians, Neo-Persians, Greeks, and Romans. And to a certain extent, the so-called Hyksos. So people need to also understand who the so-called Hyksos were. We have to use visual documentation to bring this back for other brothers and sisters to see it because they may not never make it back like you. But there were many invasions that came into Africa. When Norma that we dealt with earlier, we talk about Norma when he reunited Upper and Lower Egypt, first defeating the Scorpion, bringing together the first world government. But it spoke of the Asiatic invasions even back during his time. Egypt faced many invasions that came in by way of the Delta. These were the Asiatics that you see right here. Now. As I mentioned before, the Asiatics who came across the Sinai. So here we see the earliest recording of these people who came in and settled with us for a while to they built in numbers and then eventually attacking Egypt. This is again from Kanunhotep's tomb from the 12th dynastic period right uh, during the time of Amenhotep III. Here again, Menethos talks about now you can see the Hyksos who came into Egypt and Manetho said, unexpectedly from the region of the east came men of unknown race. Confident of the victory, they marched against our land. By force, they took it easy without a single battle. Having overpowered our rulers, they burned our cities without compassion and destroyed the temples. All the people were treated with great cruelty, for they slew some and carried off the wives of children of others into slavery. Doesn't that sound like a familiar account? Mm -hmm. This period is documented around uh, 1650 or 1750, right around the same time of Abraham. Now... Take a good look of the pictures that I showed earlier, too. These were the hike soaks that you see right here. These were the invaders, just as you see them carved in stone right here. These are the people who came out of the Sinai. Some say from Mitanni. Uh, some say they were Horians. These are the Tamarians who were indigenous to the Nile Valley, as well as the Tanihisian brothers who were further up in the southern part of uh, Egypt or Kemet, ancient Ethiopia, as some would call it. These were the Tamahu people who invaded from Libya from the west. They attacked Egypt after the sixth dynastic period. Now, it was, it, it was this brother that we showed again, Atmos I, who finally expelled them out of our land. Now, I'm showing this in reference with the temple, how our ancestors, you're witnessing, recording these people who came into our land, who invaded until Atmos I finally expelled them. We want to give you documented evidence to show you that we were at war with these people who invaded our land. We did not have anyone enslaved, but in fact, the Hyksos enslaved us for 200 years. If we deal with the 21st dynasty, 22nd dynasty, 23rd dynasty, these were all Asiatic. Shishak, that Badawi will show us in a little while, he was also of Asiatic origin. So again, indigenous African Kemetic people were not even on the throne then. This is why this is so important to understand this in the Bible because by looking at the Bible in America and the Western world, they look at this as all being part of Egypt. 
not saying that we were enslaved ourselves by these Asiatic people. And the same people who are ruling us today, who are exploiting us out of our minds, are the same people who invaded our land long ago, who came in even during the time of the 12th dynastic period, right after Amenahet. And we called them the troglodytes who came out of the desert. How can we dispute this documented evidence, documented information? But the only way we're going to get this story right, we're going to have to start writing our own holy text because if everybody else have had their story and revised the Bible, then why can't we, the original writers of the book, bring it back to its African origin? Now, right here on these temples here, now you can see documented where we tied them up, roped them, and forced them out of our land. These are the people that we've always had problems with. The problem is we don't understand a historical war. It's a historical war with these people. And European Ashkenazi, European Jews know this. We're the people who don't know it. It's an ancient historical war from the time we've had contact with them. So we're coming back here and hearing the words of our ancestors and those who knew what happened in that day, and that's why they had to turn the story against African people. So you're coming back for an eyewitness account, not for spiritual enslavement, but for spiritual freedom, for the emancipation of our souls, for the resurrection of African people. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. For many years, brothers and sisters returned back with us on the Kemet New Know Thyself Educational Tour to see an eyewitness account what our ancestors wrote for us on the temples and tombs which are books in stone that now end up in many of the biblical stories today. Let's continue with the live lecture. These are the people who enslaved our people. These people set up in an area of Kemet in Lower Kemet called Avaris, took over, and were enslaving the Africans for over 200 years until Second Enray Tao of the 17th dynasty and it is he who raised war on the battlefield and his life was lost on the battlefield and it was his son Cutmos who continued the battle until his son uh, Atmos who opened up the 18th dynasty this is a real person brothers and sisters who said never again he was the liberator the emancipator who kicked these Hicksokes out of our land this is the real historical account that we've got to start teaching our people brothers and sisters so they took from this African right here his name at most and made a Moses. This is the only account that we expelled a large group of people out of our land, this African right here, who opened up the 18th dynasty known as the Golden Age. Mm. This is the historical account, brothers and sisters. In fact, let's go into another warrior soldier, as we see in his uh, name, Men Kepara, to Hootie Mays. He had 17 battles and won them all. He also wanted to make sure that these Hicksokes were not going to come into our land. Here you see Men Kepara's battle, showing where he's battling the Hicksokes. Look at some of them hiding behind trees as cowards right here. This is the story that our ancestors left us in stone, as though they knew that one day we would forget our story. Here's the battle of Men Kepara, who battled and wanted to make sure these Hicksokes were not going to come into our land. In fact, this brother. He made sure that he even educated these people he was conquering into the Kemetic uh, history, okay? Initiated them into a, a, make sure that they will keep control of people that they're conquering. Mm -hmm. So that brother was brilliant. In fact, he put a whooping on a city so bad called Megiddo. Do you know this is where the name Army getting from came from, Megiddo right here? Mm -hmm. That's where the origin of that name came from. But this is the brother, Ursama Art Rasip Tepin Rawa Mesumori Amin, a little practice you can say it too. He also had to fight some people called the Hittites. See, we're constantly at war with these people coming from the north, brothers and sisters. We left the reliefs over 3,000 years ago carved in stone. In fact, there's one story right here where Ursama Atra told his generals, he said, cut off the right hand of the enemy. But he noticed that the right hand and the left hand was turning up. He told them to cut off the right hand to make sure that they weren't cowards. So he said, the enemy only has one of one thing I know they got and that's the penis, the foreskin. So he told them to cut off the foreskin, and that's what you see right here, the foreskin right here. These are stories and accounts that's carved on these temples, brothers and sisters. Our story is here. Now, what does that have to do with the scriptures? Well, let's go to Samuel, and it talks about David wants to marry the daughter of uh, Saul. So Saul tells him to go and do what? Cut off the foreskin of the Philistines, as it says mm. uh, in Samuel chapter 18, verse 27. Wherefore David arose and went and he and his men and slew of the Philistines. Two hundred men and David brought their foreskins and they gave them the full tale to the king that he might uh, be the king's son-in-law. So 
Here you got it written here in Saul, but long before Saul, our ancestors cut off the foreskin where Ramesu told his generals to cut off the right hand and he noticed right and left hands were turning up and he told them to cut off the foreskins where it ended up in Saul in the Bible. What makes uh, somebody who just put it on some paper versus that which is carved in stone? Spiritual enslavement. <laughs>